My name's Kate Kennedy, I'm one of the directors of Traffic Works. I've got over 20 years experience in the traffic and transport industry. And with me today I've got Alison Dewar, one of our senior traffic engineers. And between us we've prepared hundreds of TIAs and, um, and also uh, undertaken peer reviews of other consultants' TIAs, traffic impact assessments. And Alison's also spent part time for the last couple of years at one of the urban growth municipalities helping in their transport team and doing what you guys do in terms of reviewing traffic assessments for planning applications. So yes, so this afternoon's the assessment of traffic impact assessment reports. So a bit of an outline of our presentation today. Uh, we'll be talking about what is a, in a, what is a traffic assess, impact assessment, what's in a traffic impact assessment report, how do we estimate the traffic impacts of a development, and then looking at the internal site assessment, which the IDM refers to as a traffic management assessment. Uh, looking at car parking requirements for developments and uh, give you a bit of a summary of what to look out for when you're assessing traffic impact assessment reports. And just uh, a list of some useful documents that you'll use quite regularly. So what is a traffic impact assessment? It's an estimation and assessment of the impact of a proposed development on the surrounding road network and identification of any mitigating measures that might be required for road and intersection upgrades. It looks at the internal road hierarchy and functions and the connections to the external road network. And the most common types of traffic impact assessments are for subdivisions of residential or commercial land uses or for a change of land use plan. So what's in the Traffic Impact Assessment Report? Um, it needs to include a summary of the existing conditions, obviously. What's on the site? What's it currently being used for? What's the current site access arrangements? What are the traffic volumes on the surrounding road network and with the road hierarchy? What, is it fronting local roads or is it fronting arterial roads? And the connectivity of the site for vehicles, pedestrians and cyclists and the availability of public transport if it's relevant depending on your location. Then it needs to have a summary of the proposed development. What type of use is proposed and what scale of that use? Um, is it residential, commercial, industrial or a school? Uh, the proposed access arrangements, they might be similar to the current access but might be completely <coughs> different. It might have one access, it might have multiple accesses. Uh, it then needs to demonstrate what the traffic the traffic generation from that change of use is going to be uh, to and from the site. It needs to outline the car parking requirements and the proposed car parking that um, will be provided and whether they're relying on any on-street parking um, and also looking at bicycle parking if that's appropriate. And for mm -hmm. something like residential subdivisions, it's need to consider potentially the provision of traffic calming in local roads as well. So what are the traffic impacts of the development? First of all, uh, the traffic generation for that land use and scale of development. Then that's distributed to the road network and the accesses. So again, whether it's a single access or multiple accesses for bigger developments. It's going to include an assessment of the site distance at the driveways and the site access intersections, looking at uh, site distance to vehicles and pedestrians for safety. Uh, it needs to determine whether turn lanes are required. Um, so do we need a right and or a left turn lane into the site to avoid delays to through traffic on the main road? And it may need to include intersection analysis, looking at SIDRA, to work out whether a higher form of intersection control is required. So how is traffic generation estimated? The IDM talks about, for residential, residential developments, 10 trips per, 10 vehicle trips per day per dwelling. Uh, the RTA guide for traffic generating developments provides traffic generation rates for a variety of other land uses. Uh, it's got slightly lower rates for standard and medium density residential. It's also got rates for office or commercial restaurant and warehouse uses per gross floor area and that outlines trip rates per da daily trip rates and then peak hour trip rates and they're all two-way trip rates, so some of those vehicles are going in and some are coming out. Um, so a bit of a rule of thumb for residential trips uh, in the morning peak, we would say that 
about 80% of those would be outbound and 20% inbound for accounting for shift workers and people who might be returning in the morning peak period. Um, and in the PM peak, there's a bit more variability in that, so it's typically 70-30, 70% out, 30% in, or some consultants will use 60-40, um, depending on the location and some other factors. Um, and if no other data is available for your trip, for your land use type, so for say a recreational reserve or something that's a bit unusual, you might have an empirical assessment. So um, the traffic impact assessment report might rely on survey data from another similar use nearby, or it might step through and estimate um, from first principles outlining the assumptions. So for mixed use retail and commercial premises or recreational use, so it might step through the number of players on court, time the number of courts or fields that there are on the site and their arrivals prior to the game and departures post the game. And it's got a list through the assumptions and it's up for you to look through those and see whether you think they're reasonable or not. So once the trips generated by the development have been estimated, they obviously need to be distributed to the road network. So if it's a small land use that might only have one access, it's distributed to the one access point, but then it's going to come out of the site and turn left or right and the arrivals will come in each direction. If it's a bigger use, um, like this one's for a residential subdivision, it comes out at five or six intersection locations on the Princess Highway, um, we just need to estimate where the traffic comes out and back in at each location. Essentially it'll be normally the shortest route to the intersection. Um, and again, for if you're assessing the report, you're assessing whether the assumptions about the distribution to the external road network seem reasonable or not, and whether they're consistent with existing patterns or whether there's justification for why they've made those assumptions. So, for example, if there's a nearby town centre to the east of the site in the AM peak, the existing traffic flows on the, on the frontage road might be 70 to 80% heading east, you're probably going to adopt the same trip uh, distribution for your traffic leaving the site. Another thing that the TIA needs to check is the site distances available and safe at each of the access points. So uh, SISD or Safe Intersection Site Distance Requirements are set out in Osroads Guide to Road Design Part 4A. So for a setback from uh, 5 metres or an absolute minimum of 3 metres, uh, it outlines the site distance required along the major road and uh, it's the distance along the major road to see a vehicle approaching on the minor road um, to gives that driver time to decelerate the stop if the person on the minor road stalls across the intersection or something like that. Um, okay and the next slide just shows the extract from table 3.2 of SISD from um, the Austroads guide and Typically we use a reaction time of two seconds, so you can see there for a design speed of 100 kilometres an hour, the SISD requirement is 248 metres in both directions. Um, there are adjustments up and down for uphill and downhill grades, and you might use a reduced reaction time of one and a half seconds if, you, if it's an environment where you expect the drivers to be alert, such as a school speed zone, but otherwise you you would normally keep the two second reaction time. Um, there's also entering site distance, which uh, is to vehicles at driveways. So uh, the Australian Standard for Off-Street Car Parks um, has this table in it, um, which has reduced or shorter site distance requirements at a driveway. So you can see there for the frontage road speed of 100 kilometres an hour, the site distance requirement is 160 metres, so it's considerably shorter. Um, and you'd need to, if those sight lines aren't achieved, you need to look at what needs to be done to achieve the sight lines, so it might be trimming vegetation or changing boundary fences. Um, okay. There's also uh, a sight distance requirement to be looking for achieving sight distance to pedestrians at driveways, so from a two and a half metre setback on the driveway, that two metre display uh, or that triangle needs to be provided so that again no landscaping or boundary fences should be within that zone, otherwise um, 
a, vehicle, a drive at leaving that driveway won't be able to see a pedestrian along the frontage path. So which site distance? Because I just talked about SISD and ESD. It comes down to whether it's a driveway or an intersection. So the Australian standard for off-street car parking states that a driveway has curbs and footpaths that are continuous through the junction with the frontage road. The appearance and character of the driveway shall be such that it will be clear to drivers that pedestrians and frontage road traffic have priority of movement. Whereas at an intersection, the entry and exit shall be designed as if it's for a public roadway with all necessary traffic control devices and intersection geometry requirements. So it'll look quite different. So if it looks like an intersection, it needs to have the higher <coughs> site distance requirements. So then at your site access, you're going to look at whether a turn lane is needed um, to minimise delays to the traffic on the main road. Um, do we need a right or a left turn lane? Ostroads Guide to Traffic Management Part 6 sets out the requirements for turn lanes at intersections based on operating speed, turning traffic volumes and through traffic volumes. And you plot on there particularly where the spot is and it'll tell you whether your turn lane can be a basic turn lane or a channelised turn lane. There are three graphs. That graph's shown for design speeds of 100 k's an hour and above, and there are other ones for 70 to 100 and less than 70, but they're all in the same spot in that Ostroads guide. Um, and then this is the turn lane geometry, just a couple of figures showing the basic right turn and channelised right turn for rural treatments. There are alternate designs for urban turn lanes um, that have curb and parking in them, so they're available in the guides as well. Um, then sometimes there's a high level of intersection analysis required. So the consultant might use SIDRA to assist to determine when an intersection might require an upgrade, a further upgrade beyond a simple left or right turn lanes. Uh, so the intersection should operate below practical capacity immediately post-construction or when the development is fully developed, but also in 10 years time post-construction applying a growth factor. So typically that growth factor is applied to your frontage road and typically it might be between 1 and 3% but in some areas if there's been high growth it can be as high as 6% um, and you might have historical data um, from previous traffic counts that you can look at and work out what that growth rate should be. Um, and practical capacity occurs when the degree of saturation of the intersection is equal to 0.8 for a sign controlled intersection, 0.85 for roundabouts or 0.9 for traffic signals. Um, this, the intersection analysis can also be used to work out when the trigger point for, in the development is, uh, what trigger point is appropriate that the intersection needs to be upgraded, particularly if it's expensive, the developer won't want to signalise or, round, or construct a roundabout at the start. Of the before they've done anything else. So it might be that they've got six stages of development and it's not until the third or fourth stage is developed that that intersection upgrade is required. Um, and it'll also sh you can be used to show interim and ultimate scenarios, so similar to that. Uh, looking at intersection ana analysis, so the SIDRA files or you can, you can request the SIDRA files and get the soft copy files if you've got the software to look at those um, at work. If you don't, you can look at the input files, so you'll typically be able to check the geometry of the intersection that's been modelled um, and they might have an existing conditions and a future conditions case, so if there's existing conditions you might look at whether the queue lengths match what's happening on site and your local knowledge of that intersection the intersection analysis in terms of the output. So this shows output for some traffic signals and essentially we're going to look at does the intersection operate within practical capacity? So down the bottom there's a circle around the important number that shows the DOS for the intersection. Um, and that one actually shows it's just over capacity but that's in the ultimate scenario in 10 years time which you might accept as being okay. Um, but also another point to note there that's circled up the top is will the vehicle queues fit within the turn lanes? So that shows a 25 metre turn lane length with a 32.9 metre queue in it. So the queue of vehicles in that turn lane is going to spill over into the adjacent through lane. So you'd probably be looking at extending 
that right, Tony? Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Alison to talk about the internal road network. Great. Well, hello, everyone. So, Kate's obviously been through a lot of the impact on the external network and what we need to look at that. Um, and on certain types of developments, especially uh, large residential subdivisions, but even it can be applicable to anything, but that's probably where it's most commonly used. Um, we do also need to look at the internal network within the development site. Um, so one thing we do look at is road capacities. And once we've got our traffic generation and our distribution, as Kate's talked about, um, once that's been distributed onto the network, will those roads be able to cater for the volume of traffic that will be anticipated once the development is in place? Uh, so the IDM provides guidance on different types of road cross sections for a variety of hierarchy roads, um, which talks about the road reserve width as well as the carriageway width, uh, provision of parking, uh, pedestrian or bicycle facilities, um, as well as uh, what the IDM refers to as an indicative maximum traffic volume for the road, or as sometimes we call it, as an intended capacity. And this is based on the amenity of the road. So a local access street, uh, which is just providing access to say 30 houses or 10 houses, isn't expected to have a high volume of traffic and a very, it should have quite a good level of amenity. And so these intended capacities are for, yeah, to, to align with that, that amenity value. Um, there's also additional guidance in a couple of other documents. Um, some areas have precinct structure plans from the VPA, probably more in the uh, inner areas, but I know this example of a cross section is from uh, alert in Whittlesey, um, which again provides additional guidance for specific areas on what roads should look like for the hierarchy uh, and what type of traffic volumes they'll be carrying. And there's also guidance um, in Council's planning scheme in their access and mobility clause. Um, and I've just provided an example of that to the my left of the screen. <laughs> um, which again provides some additional guidance on what should be provided. Um, so we can check what the development is proposing against that and if it, if it aligns that's great and if not then whether certain upgrades might need to take place for that. Um, one thing to note though is those provide I suppose the intended capacity of the road based on amenity. Um, something to consider is that's not the actual capacity of a roadway. Um, and in reference to Ostro's Guide Part 3 Traffic Studies, um, it talks about the actual capacity of a lane. You can see that there's quite a few, which are about 900 vehicles an hour in a lane, with a little bit of variance depending on the roadside conditions. As a rule of thumb, we use about 10% of the daily volume occurs in the peak hour. So extrapolating that out, a two-lane, two-way road can carry up to about 18,000 vehicles a day. That's probably higher than a lot of the amenity standards require, but it is possible. <laughs> Other things to consider within the internal network um, are how are the roads laid out? Do they make sense? Can we get through? But also, if there are long lengths of straight road, these should be designed so that speeds are enforceable. Um, self-enforceable. So we might have provision of traffic calming devices if required, could be road humps or roundabouts or other treatments that are used in the local area. Um, and usually if the straight is 2 to 250 metres long, anything above that, we would be looking to put a device in there to control that speed. The other thing to look at is on a road safety grounds, we try and avoid cross intersections where possible. Uh, at a cross intersection, there's a lot more points of conflict potential for all the turning movements. And so generally when we're looking at a uh, cross intersection, ideally it, these type of intersections would either be controlled with a roundabout or some type of formalised treatment, so the priority is very clear. Or, um, as in this photo here, we can stagger the intersection. So it reduces conflict and increases safety. Uh, again, something to look for. You can see that the intersection I've circled there 
you would turn right first and then left. And that's the intended way to stagger uh, as it doesn't cause the vehicle to get trapped, I suppose, within that intersection and, and cause delay. Whereas if it was the other way around, you'd turn left and then you would have to prop within that road before you turned right. So uh, efficiency wise, this right to left stagger is preferred. So a couple of other things to look for is, do we need to provide for pedestrians and bicycles? And if we do, is it, has it been proposed? Where is it proposed? Does it align with uh, our strategy, council strategy, or connectivity to other paths? Um, it's just something to check. And, and especially for commercial style developments, uh, if there are cycle facilities and paths which connect there, are there end of trip facilities, so bicycle hoops, so can someone park their bike or, or in an office development do they have showers for people to use after they cycle? Um, thinking about buses as well, if they're relevant to the area, um, is the road wide enough to cater for it? As well as CFA requirements, uh, there are some guidelines for CFA requirements uh, in subdivisions and different areas. And for example, they usually require three and a half metres between curbs. So if there's a boulevard street being proposed with a median in the middle, do they meet that minimum width? And if they don't, uh, that might need to be modified, otherwise CFA will come back and say, hey, we can't fit. Um, to move on from that, sweat path assessments of that internal network are quite important. Um, so we do them for car parking layouts, uh, and residential garages, but also throughout, if they are subdivisions, uh, local access streets, can the vehicles turn at each of the corners and, and do they get good access throughout the site? Um, sweat paths, something to look for, is usually require 300 mil clearances on both sides of the vehicles, which just allows, you know, if there's a wall, you don't want the vehicle right up to the wall. You want to allow that 300 mil clearance uh, that's something to check for because sometimes they may get left off. So something always to keep in mind. Um, the other thing to check is have the sweat paths been done with the with a vehicle that will be using the road. So we talk about the design vehicle as the vehicle that's anticipated to use the road as a on a frequent basis. Whereas the check vehicle is what's the largest vehicle that might ever go through here and can it make the turn? So a check vehicle may need to use an adjacent lane to make a turn, um, but as long as it's not something that's going to be doing it every day, that might be acceptable. Um, the IDM also provides guidance on the size of vehicles which are applicable to each type of road uh, and the hierarchy of roads. Car parking. Car parking requirements are something that we do need to check. If there's a new site, we want people to be able to come and park and not overspill onto the local road. Uh, so generally we look at uh, the council planning scheme. So clause uh, 5206 is usually what we refer to and they provide a range of rates for different uses um, and what the car parking provision is required. Um, column A is our standard rate of parking and is applied to most developments. There is column B um, which is usually when there's a parking overlay or something in the area. Um, there's also bicycle parking requirements, so if that's relevant then we can be looking that and again providing those facilities to, to support cyclists. Uh, where parking requirements aren't specified in the planning scheme, similar to needs to be done for the traffic generation, we can do an empirical assessment um, and again a sports reserve is one example of this. Uh, this gives an example of a sports oval um, in Emerald actually, uh, which has the oval, it has tennis courts, and it also has a library on the same site. Um, so looking at it, uh, how many games are going to be at once, and is there overlap between games, and what parking requirement will be there for spectators, players, and then for each of the uses together. And that's kind of what the picture to the, to the left is showing, the, the overlap between parking, and we can find the maximum required based on that type of assessment. So when we're looking at car parking, the thing to look for is, is the required amount of parking provided on site? And if it's not, is there a good reason for it? Is it provided 
on street. Um, is that okay? Is it, is it available? Um, if it's in a mixed use commercial zone, are there multi-purpose trips? So someone might go to the retail store and the supermarket at once. Or if there's a childcare centre, drop their child off and then go to the supermarket, that type of thing. So sometimes parking requirements can be reduced based on that. Um, in town centres, sometimes Vista data from census uh, can be useful, um, as in certain town centres might have lower car ownership rates or high public transport, um, you know, whether it was a centre of Bendigo and there was an, a, you know, something going on, whether that would require less. Um, and again, we look at an empirical assessment, um, as well as the temporal demand for parking. So different users sharing a mixed use site, but that may have different peak uh, operation hours. This shows an example of a mixed use site and the demand for car parking, how that that changes based on the statutory requirement versus the uh, likely peak demand for parking. So this shows a variety with a childcare centre, medical centre, uh, convenience restaurant and some retail. And if you add up all of the requirements, statutory requirements, we get 120 spaces. But if we look at when each of the users is open during the day, uh, when the likely uh, peak is, <coughs> so the peak time for a swim school might be during the day, for example, and if the childcare centre pick up and drop off is either side of that, it might reduce the overall parking demand. So then this graph over there is showing the cumulative parking demand across that, um, which reduces the peak demand to only 100 spaces. So that's something that we can consider uh, when, when assessing that type of impact. Car parking layouts is also something. Um, important to have a look at. There are dimensions for car parking spaces, access aisles and uh, ramps uh, within the planning scheme as well as in the Australian standards for car parking. Um, if car parking spaces are designed to the dimension that's in the planning scheme, generally they would be uh, accessible and they, you know, cars can get in and out. It's still important to to seek swept path assessments in car parks sometimes, uh, if they're near a wall or an end of an access aisle, to, to make sure that even if it's the right dimension, which we check first, that they're still accessible from the access aisle to enter and exit. Okay, so in summary, what do we look for? What are the take home things we need to look for in our traffic impact assessment? So we've got, is the traffic generation and the access requirements reasonable to and from the development site? Um, do the assumptions make sense? So if we've done an empirical assessment, is it justified? Um, but also, if they were out by, say, a factor of 50%, does that make a big impact to us? Uh, if it has a large impact and you think maybe it doesn't sound quite right, it's something to question. But sometimes a, a change may not make a big difference, so the overall output might be quite similar. Um, and also for large subdivisions, are there enough individual access points? If you've got a very large access coming out of one, it might be congested, but if you split it across two, that might help, help alleviate. And has the traffic impact assessment considered the whole development? Or if it's a staged, if there are other stages to go? So for example, if you're in an area and there's one thing going in, but if there's something happening next door on the property, does it consider that there may be an impact of both? And that doesn't mean to say that the developer of this site needs to foot the bill for everything, but it is something good for councils to, to realise what's going on and if there's an impact from a number of different places in the same area, um, to come up with a solution which will obviously alleviate traffic for, for everyone. Um, and the other thing is, does it miss something out? Is there a nearby intersection which they haven't spoken about? And, and that you think will have an impact. If traffic's going down the road and, and to an intersection, but they've left it out, that may be something you might need to question, just in case. Um, and car parking, so we're looking at provision, we're looking at parking layout, and we're looking at bicycle parking requirements. Um, and then for swept path assessments, take home things are, we need to check for clearances, and have they used the right type of vehicle? to do the assessment by. 
Uh, a couple of additional things to mention is if there's a traffic report, uh, you can always get a peer review done um, by another traffic engineer. I know we've done that for certain developments, uh, which is quite useful if it's quite complicated um, and you'd like a second opinion, that's always an option. Um, sometimes the applications might go to VCAT and you can get expert witness statements from traffic engineers uh, as an assessment. Um, and sometimes road safety audits uh, of external intersections may be appropriate if there's something new going in. Um, I know Vic Roads do require audits of external intersections. Um, and so sometimes, depending on what it is, that may be, may be useful to have done. Um, the following is just a list of useful documents um, and where to find different things, uh, useful clauses within the council's planning scheme, as well as the IDM has lots of information on a whole bunch of things I'm sure you've heard about. Um, but obviously key points in there to, to check for. The RTA guide, while New South Wales, we do adopt it quite often for traffic generation. There's Austroads guides, Australian standards, and then also the CFA subdivision guidelines. And then VicRoads also have supplements to some of the Australian standards and VicRoads guides, uh, not VicRoads, Austroads guides. Uh, so they're quite useful to check in case Victoria is deviating or providing additional information to those guidelines. Um, thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go right ahead. <laughs> With caravan parks, I'm yes. interested. I find that uh, hard to get traffic generations in the literature other than maybe interpreting a motel or something like that. Um, I think that's the thing. There are a lot of uses which don't have data available. Um, and that's where I suppose when you're getting applications in and things like that, consultants probably look at how many, how many vehicles they think will be coming in based on the number of lots and different things. I think you're right with a motel. Caravans are obviously interesting because they have a lot of long vehicles coming in and out of them um, and spread across the day. So the, the, the peak hours are not always during commuter peaks. Which <laughs> um, I know sometimes we would do surveys of a similar site. Um, we did one in Mildura. We've done a few caravans. We've done a few. Yeah. I'm thinking Mildura. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we were surveying and looking at what currently happens at there and, and looking at their movements, which can give us an idea if it's a similar site, what, what may happen. Um, and then looking at the number of plots within that site and making a judgement call on if it's 100% full, what's likely to happen. But, but you're right, look, there are a lot of uses which are difficult to estimate. Um, and I suppose it's important that um, when you're looking at traffic things, to check the assumptions and make sure that it, it makes sense um, to, to try and get that, that figure at the end. Um, so do we have the right to go back to the traffic engineer and say, Look, you know, give us actually go there and do a do a count at the site, and just you know give us some sort of indication of what's going on. Cause that that's probably already done anyway, isn't it? It's, yeah. if it's um, an extension free, to an existing. If it's an extension to an existing caravan park, yeah. yes, that's what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, because they've got that data and their client right there ready to go. Mm. If it's a new site, it's a little bit more it's difficult. More difficult. Yeah. Um, because different areas obviously have different things, but an existing one. So, so if, if, you're, if you've only got a motel, I'd like to compare this actually, I don't think the RTA have uh, caravan park sites as a traffic generator, so if you use a motel, is it, from your experience, is that pretty well, you know, replicate what actually happens on a caravan park site, or is there some factor that you apply to, uh, to make adjustment? I'd say they'd be different because the yeah. motel might have business use, but a caravan park, whilst it might have cabins and sites, mm. it'll have more of a recreational use. So it's going to have peaks on holiday periods and long weekends, Easter peak, Christmas peak, and that sort of thing. So that could be quite different to what's happening at a motel. Motels are very different because you could have a motel 
in a set of Bendigo that's going to be very different to a motel down at the beach somewhere because their uses can still be and peaks could be quite different. So the negative of a new site you just kind of survey the traffic generation from comparative caravan parks around the area. Oh well, yeah. Mm. Yeah. In a similar location for a similar type of yeah. type of place, yeah. If you're you looking at turn lanes and things. Yeah. Yeah. Traffic data, <coughs> the traffic counts, how all the data can be assessed for a traffic impact assessment, like if it's from 2023, can we, uh, sorry, 2005 or something like mm -hmm. that, very old data, does it need to be multiplied by some factor or anything? Um, I suppose depending on the area it's <coughs> in, it would make a big difference. Yes. Um, and, and obviously you'll know your local area pretty well. Um, if there's been a lot of growth in the area, you may need new data if it's 10 years old. Um, but otherwise, a, a growth factor would need to be generally applied. Mm. One or two percent, one or two percent underlying percent. usually, unless so, it's a growth area, which it could be as high as six percent. So, if you don't know, it might be um, even the Vic Road data that's on the Vic Data Portal <coughs> is some of it's. Uh, surveyed regularly, some of it's not, and it's kind of estimated. And we have found that sometimes when we've relied on that, and then it might show a higher volume, and then when we've subsequently gone back and done a traffic count, the actual counting row has been much lower. So, for the cost of doing a survey or even a tube count, it's probably better just to do it because then you get a more accurate representation of your volume. Is it still 10 months after we reach this traffic impact assessment is required? The IDM says 10. The IDM says 10, but yeah. um, the planners can ask for whatever they like. I mean, we do it. We do them for one residential lot being subdivided into two lots in some places. So it depends where, you know, in an urban location, we would do them for a simple two yeah. lot subdivision. Doesn't the IDM also give a percentage increase? You can ask for it if there's a certain percentage, you, you anticipate a certain percentage increase? Have I got that wrong? Yeah, I think it's 10 100 vehicles. I think, yeah. 10% or 100 vehicles. There's a big difference document there. Yeah. 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 I think on the other hand, just to add that, sometimes when I've seen, when I've done some work for councils and I've seen planning applications come in, sometimes um, there's not a traffic report as such. Um, the planning application itself provides enough detail um, so whether there's not a justification for generation, but say there's some layout and some sweat paths and some additional information, you, may, you might be able to make that judgment call based on that without a traffic report, um, just depending on, on the site. So I suppose there's, there's two sides to, to yeah. that, depending on its use and yeah. type. And Is it the same with Sidra, that the amount of vehicles or the number of people, so we can ask for any amount of vehicles? Sidra is great for capacity um, and, and it does tell you, I suppose, it depends on how much traffic's being generated. If there's a small amount of traffic being generated and the intersection appears to operate well below capacity now, um, you, you can probably gauge that it's unlikely to have a massive impact. Um, if intersections are quite close to capacity already, quite congested, maybe even a small amount of traffic may have a big impact and, 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 and trigger some type of change there. Um, and it's hard to give a, a, a blanket rule on, on when to ask for it or not, but I suppose it's making the judgment call on how much impact will it have. And, and if you're concerned that it is gonna create issues, then maybe it's worth asking for it, but yeah. yeah. Um, over, over here. Yeah, um, this is from the city of KC, is the point of view. Uh, majority of the traffic reports that we get in relation to traffic distributions are estimated by the consultants. Mm -hmm. And you know, in house, we have to do an estimation ourselves by doing desktop exercises. And this affects in the future and existing intersection. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a better way of doing things? Well, I can give you an example of what another municipality in a growth area that has done, and they've employed 
at Consult, they, we worked for them as their peer reviewer. Um, and their thinking was that they have in-house traffic engineers, but their thinking was that if it saved them $2 million in infrastructure costs because of overdevelopment in the area and not fighting the battles early, that the $20,000 for consultant fees were worth spending. So sometimes, and if you know that you're going to end up in panel or VCAT, sometimes you need a traffic engineer with you anyway, if you haven't got the expertise or enough, you might not have enough resources in-house to spend the time on it to cope with that, with all of your other planning applications as well. So um, that's what one other mm. municipality did as an example. Um, we've done peer reviews for objectors and other applicants. Um, otherwise, I suppose it's trying to follow through the, that method that we went through and just checking the assumptions and what the consultants put forward as to whether it's reasonable or not. <laughs> and uh, whether you agree with it or not. It's the same process we do, so you're doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the middle. Yeah. Um, you touched on 85th percentile uh, vehicles and then movements. Mm -hmm. um, I was just hoping to get your sort of uh, perspective or um, any sort of input on whether or not, or in which scenarios you'd adopt the 99, the B99 vehicle in terms of demonstrating um, I'll give you an example. Um, when it comes to under under carriage uh, clearance to a vehicle to a sort of commercial site or something that's okay. got multi use, I'll request a B99. Uh, when it's a residential B85, I, I adopt. I was just wondering if you guys had any sort of uh, scenarios that where you go above the B85 in terms of. Uh, vehicle. Um, usually, usually. Um, <laughs> Quite often within a car park itself, getting in and out of car parking spaces, for example, we would usually go with a B85. Um, and I think that's probably what the, the requirements are designed around. Um, one time, for example, entering a commercial site, we usually look for, uh, for example, simultaneous entry and exit movements. So usually that would be with one B85 and then a B80, B99 in the other direction and vice versa, that kind of thing. So access. Um, ramp clearances, I think we do for B99 as well, which, which is kind of what you're saying. Um, it's, it is really site specific. And I, I suppose also looking at it on your commercial sites as well, if you're expecting heavier vehicles, larger vehicles in them, obviously they, their access is important as well. Um, and, and working out what size of waste collection vehicle does it need to go in and, and, and where does it need to go, or a commercial site, are there semi-trailers going in there and, and things. So I suppose that's very site specific, but um, between the, the two, yeah, usually B99s for access aisles and access, whereas B85s for car parks. For the actual individual bay. Yeah. yeah. Also with the waste collection vehicles, there's the 8.8 .8 or the 10.5. Yes. That's right. And also um, some waste collection vehicles lift overhead. So if you're in an underground area, you'd obviously need to have the height clearance or else accepting that someone's got to drag the bins out up mm -hmm. a ramp, out to the road. And the, just the logistics of how all that works and just the sanity check as to whether it makes sense. And uh, fine. I was yeah, just curious if there was uh, any yeah. sort of like scenarios that... Um, maybe uh, we haven't thought of come across because um, it sounds like generally 85 to go unless it's a very uh, niche sort of or a very important scenario. Yeah, okay. Um, quick, quick question. There was probably just looking for interpretation. You mentioned site distances. Um, why are site distances less for driveways over intersections? It's sort of, I know we understand the sort of state differences, but I'm just sort of wondering why. Probably a, a risk issue and just a volume issue that an intersection you will have an expectation of more vehicles on the side road or the minor road, <coughs> whereas a, um, a driveway, someone coming out of the driveway is probably a bit more cautious, plus there's fewer of them. So. Mm -hmm. And I guess to expect a 285 metres site distance from a driveway is going, might be unrealistic. Touching on Thomas' comment, yep. the 300 mile clearance, is that a should 
the master suggested when doing internal measurements? Checks? Yeah, that's a good um, question because I think the IDM talks about 600 mil offset to physical obstructions. obstructions. Mm. Um, but if you see swept paths of two vehicles without any clearances on them, because the swept path just might show the vehicle or the edge of the vehicle or, or the wheel path, yep. um, and they're running close to each other, then that's not going to be practical for those vehicles to actually physically pass each other. So it depends on, again, the risk or the likelihood of the vehicles passing. And if it's into a two-bay car park, maybe it doesn't matter. Yep. But if it's a bigger site, then mm. um, I feel... The three I the three hundred comes from the Australian standard for, for car parking, I'm pretty sure. It's one of the Australian so standards. Standard then. So it is part of the Australian standards is the three hundred clearances. Um, and even along ramps around corners, there's slightly different, slightly larger clearances on the inside of the curve and mm -hmm. and, and obviously the IDM if it's if it's six hundred. Yeah. There's a variety. Um, I think three hundred is about the smallest that's part of the guidelines or standards. Um, but yeah, as Kate said, depending on what the use is. Yeah, but if it's and, 300 and to each vehicle, then it still really is 600 from the hazard yeah. of the, the other vehicles. So. Yeah, I only ask because sometimes we go, it's a standard in the Australian mm -hmm. standard, and then the planning scheme is turning movements. It doesn't say turning movements with 300 clearance. So you only have to show that the cars can pass. Yeah. It might be mirrors touching. Yeah. But that means mm -hmm. it passes. So. Yeah. We've had other ones checking garages that met the planning scheme requirements, but the sweat parts still didn't work. So it's, it's quite challenging sometimes that there's conflicting advice. Yeah. Mm. Hey, what would you see as the, the advantages or the pros and cons of asking for a TIAR report before planning permit approval? That's a good question because we often see we're sometimes engaged to provide a TIR as a condition on a permit. And then I think it's quite challenging for the applicant because they've probably been happy thinking they've got their permit, but they haven't realised that they've got to spend $300,000 on turn lanes as part of their development. And they've been blindsided because they haven't been aware that that was even an issue. So if I can recommend, well, not that it's to you guys, it's to your planners, but I think it the earlier the better. So if it's in the planning pro process, do it as a request for further information. Far more valuable <coughs> for everybody. Because they might have to change the scale of their development or slightly what they're doing. There might be a smarter way that they can do things. They might be able to change their access. Or it's, it seems to me a little bit late to do it as a condition on a permit. But that's my opinion. No, I, I, I <laughs> agree. Strategic planners tend to include it in their structure plans, which is helpful. Um, the planners that generally discourage me from putting them in conditionally because of the, as you've just explained, the, the possible ramifications and the fact that the development may not go ahead. But they should ask for it as a request for further information before they, they give the permit. They should, so, yeah. they should and, uh, and perhaps let the engineers know that they're doing that to, yeah. to, to work on the Yeah, I think it'd do it earlier. Yeah, mm. yeah. definitely. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, in regards to uh, subdivisions where you've got like your internal road network, um, is there any sort of guides as to what constitutes having amenity issues for roads? Because the reason why I'm asking this is because a lot of developers seem to push or try to push lots of lots to, to one access point and, and I sit there arguing points of, you know, you might have safety many issues, is there any sort of tables where you can gauge and, and defend these kind of values? Um, I'll put it down to road, think. <coughs> the hierarchy of the roads and... Yeah, like say, so like, for example, you've got to collect the road or a yeah. local road and so yeah. forth. Mm. What constitutes them having community issues? What, what levels of vehicles per hour. Well, I think those, um, the, the intended capacities for each of those roads sort of includes those amenity issues. So, because um, the roads can physically carry more, as Alison pointed out, but um, I think if 
good planning is to spread it out and um, try to have a number of accesses, depending on the scale of it. But um, yeah, it's mm. it's hard to answer without. I suppose it goes back to the road hierarchy and those intended capacities and, and the yeah layout. And and depending what area you're in or which guide you're specifically referring to, um, I know in areas with PSPs they have very specific guidelines on what roads should be on what hierarchy and what volume they're intended to carry. For example, a connector road up to 7,000 vehicles a day in a lot of the PSPs. But depending on where you are um, and, and, what, and what's applicable to, the, to, the, to that site, um, a different yeah, range of vehicle volumes. But there is the guidance in the IDM as well as the planning scheme and a PSP document if it's applicable to the area to try and guide that. Um, and it's, yeah, it's the overall cross section. Are there footpaths? Are there mm. everything else as well? Are there are there trees and nature strips mm. and parking versus non-parking, mm. depending on the level of the road. Usually, the the online parking marked on street parking, for example, is usually on the higher order road with higher volumes, that type of thing. So, are you in amenity? How how do you really judge amenity? Um, difficult to do but I suppose in line with those guidelines then you're saying that they're pushing, of... pushing those limits so they're trying to get they'll, they're estimating that they'll have 7,000 vehicles on that road well I'm, I'm, I'm like they'll have one access point with 685 lots yeah okay. so when you've got you know, like they might say look this is a connector road but yeah. the connector road's only 100 meters yeah rather than connecting through a residential subdivision yes and you have, sure. have to argue the point that you know, you might have safety issues, yeah. noise, mm, yeah. whatever, and, and like, if it's a connector road, then it's supposed to be connecting from one side to the other, not just a good portion. Well, they might need to get buses in there too. There's no point buses going 100 metres and doing a U-turn and yeah. going out. So, yeah. look, I, I, had, I had looked at um, some, some other guides and court said 1,500 vehicles per hour for local roads, for example, mm. you know, or 5,000 yeah. for a connector. So I just, I just to look at you on it. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see because the intersection where they've got that coming out on the main road's probably got problems as well if they've got 7,000 vehicles coming out to one point. So we'd be asking for them to look at that as well. Mm. Mm. Not an easy answer. No. <laughs> it's not an exact science, I suppose, is what we're saying as well. <laughs> yeah. A bit we, we've got a PSP that um, creates a road with seven and a half metre frontages and um, what's a reasonable distance for people to park as a visitor's parking space when you've got a 180 metre length road of seven and a half metre frontages. With a driveway so they can't park in front? Not yeah. reloaded. Not reloaded. No. Yeah. Front loaded. Yeah. PSP approved. BPA. Interesting. Yeah. Sounds difficult. Yeah. Well, normally for commercial developments, we'll say about 200 metres that people <coughs> would walk to a restaurant or yeah. something. They've got to so. actually park around the corner and yeah. down the street. Yeah. Is there visitor road. parking provided separately? There's no, around no the visitor corner. parking. That's no visitor parking. Street. Maybe just the un unpopular people will buy those houses. <laughs> 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 but it seems to have been missed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's not enough, really enough space for no. parking. All right. No. I think that's been very informative. If you could please uh, show your appreciation. Mm -hmm.